Hello, we're going to get started now with our keynote address. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Jesse Watrous, Senior Associate with the Evidence-Based Practice Group at the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the afternoon, Dr. Dell Elliott. The Casey Foundation has benefited greatly with partnering with the Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development for the last seven years. This partnership has been important to the foundation because the evidence-based practice group is focused on two issues that Kathy Stack referred to yesterday. The first is increasing the use of evidence, and the second is building evidence. The Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development website is a key tool for the field, and it's one of the primary tools that the foundation is promoting in our work with public systems and community. We're really very grateful for Dr. Dell Elliott's leadership. He's been a forerunner in the translation of research to practice and policy in his role with the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Elliott is founding director and principal investigator for Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development. He's a distinguished professor, the director of the program on problem behavior and positive youth development, and a research professor in the Institute of Behavioral Science. Dr. Elliott has contributed significantly to our understanding of how to help youth grow up healthy and strong, avoiding problem behaviors and involvement with the criminal justice system. He's been director of the National Youth Survey, a 30-year longitudinal study of criminal behavior and drug use. He was science editor for the U.S. Surgeon General's report on youth violence in 2001. He is fellow and past president of the American Society of Criminology. For decades, he was one of the most cited authors in American criminology and criminal justice journals, and his recent books include Good Kids from Bad Neighborhoods, great title, huh? <laughs> and a forthcoming book, Preventing Crime. Dr. Elliott has not only made youth, the focus, youth development the focus of his career, but he's also lived his life surrounded by children and youth. He's a father, a grandfather, and a great-grandfather. He says he's learned as much from that role as his role as a researcher. And little known fact, he, he has a pass to Disneyland. <laughs> and he continues to go there to reconnect to the joys of childhood. I think doing this work can kind of keep you, um, it's hard sometimes to look at some of the tough issues that we need to think about, but so reconnecting to that childhood and how happy that can be for um, hopefully all youth in our country. Good place to do that. And anyone who knows Dell knows that he brings to the conversation not only the determined clarity of a seasoned, dedicated researcher, but truly, and I say that from the bottom of my heart in all my interactions, just this joy and kindness that um, you don't always see. So I just, I really have appreciated the opportunity to work with him and his leadership, and I'm honored to be able to introduce him here today. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this opportunity to, <clears throat> to talk to you. Um, I hope that uh, as we're drawing to the uh, close of this uh, uh, Blueprints conference that you've learned some new things, that you've met some new people and have formed some new uh, collegial relationships and broadened your networks. And I hope that uh, when you leave, you leave with a renewed hope uh, in the promise that uh, the kind of programs that we're promoting can actually change lives for families and children uh, in our country. Um, I would like to share a major concern with you. Um, and, and that concern is that while we have talked a lot about evidence-based programs and, 
And, and the evidence-based initiative has really taken hold in this country, and that term is used uh, by uh, practitioners, it's used by researchers, it's used in legislation, it's used by politicians, and my concern is that they're not all talking about the same thing. And so I want to talk about what that term means and whether <clears throat> the diversity of meanings which currently exists is going to essentially undermine the significance of our using that term. Uh, because I think there's a real danger uh, in losing the momentum that we started with when we started talking about evidence-based programs. So I, I want to talk about that issue. I fear that that might cause some concern among some of you. I apologize uh, ahead of time for that. It's, it's a little like <clears throat> an experience that uh, it's one of the Colorado State Troopers had was on I-25 and watching the cars uh, come down I-25 uh, going south. Um, and at that point, the speed limit's 75, so it's a, it's a very fast-moving uh, uh, freeway. And he noticed a car driving in the right-hand lane doing about 20 miles an hour. And it was a terrific hazard because people were coming up on it suddenly and having to turn quickly to avoid that car, so he, he pulled the car over. It was an out-of-state car. And there were four women in the car, two in the front and two in the back, elderly women. And he came up to the driver and he said, ma'am, do you know how fast you were going? And she said, yes, sir. I know exactly how fast I was going. I make it a point to always drive the speed limit. I do exactly what the speed limit is. And he said, oh, he said, oh I think you have confused the highway sign for the speed limit sign. This, this is Highway 25, but the speed limit here is 75, and you are creating a traffic hazard. And she was just terribly embarrassed, and she said, oh, oh I am so sorry that, that I didn't realize that I wasn't really paying attention, and, and I'm sorry, I, I, I promise you, I will pick up my speed and I will drive exactly 75 miles an hour. And he said, okay. But he noticed that the two ladies sitting in the back seat were still sitting there kind of really still in shock. And he said, uh, are the ladies in the back going to be okay? And the driver said, yeah, that's going to be fine, officers. Just that two miles back, we came off of Highway 119. <laughs> so it's a little like that. So you may feel like you just came off of Highway 119, um, and there we go. So let's proceed to uh, talk about what I think is a difficult issue. So when we talk about the meaning of evidence-based, we get all kinds of different approaches. I've talked to people who told me that they're implementing MST. And you, when you probe a little bit, they have no idea what MST is about. They say, oh, we're using the same strategy that they use in MST. That, that fortunately, is, is a relatively rare occurrence. But here's my perception, at least, of what, when this movement started, what we meant by the term evidence-based. We were referring to experimental evidence from rigorous trials providing statistically significant positive effects. We're talking about evidence that there's a causal relationship between participation in the program and a reduction in the outcome that that program was designed to influence. This, in fact, is a minimum standard that's been endorsed by the Society for Prevention Research by the American Psychological Association, by the Institute of Medicine, by Shadis Cook and Campbell, the acknowledged experts on evaluation, and all of the major registries use that as a minimum definition for an evidence-based program. That there's experimental evidence demonstrating a causal relationship between participation in the program or that practice and the outcome uh, that we're uh, concerned about. 
What's happened is that the idea has morphed into the fact that evidence is a continuum. And that there's a continuum of evidence from the level we talked about here, clear on down to evidence that's based upon testimony, evidence that's based upon satisfaction surveys, evidence that's based upon expert opinion. There, there are all these different levels of evidence. And in all honesty, the term evidence-based is ambiguous. It talks about evidence, and there is indeed a continuum of evidence. So the question is, have we lost the idea that evidence-based refers to a particular level and type of evidence? And, and that's the question. So here's, here's one uh, example of what uh, the evidence continuum might look like, uh, looking at what I would call uh, some labels like opinion-informed evidence or research-informed evidence or uh, evidence-based experimental evidence. And the types of evidence go all the way from anecdotes to testimonials to personal experience satisfaction surveys to post-test only kinds of data to pre-post outcome surveys, both of which are a part of the continuum of evidence that we need to build to the point that we get experimental evidence. Correlational studies, and then we get into what are experimental studies that can make causal inference, and those include quasi-experimental studies uh, with match control groups or randomized control trials, and ultimately what we want and what we call uh, in blueprints model programs or model plus programs where we have multiple randomized control trials, we have replication, we have evidence of sustainability, we have a level of evidence where the confidence that we can put on a program that we're thinking of taking to scale with some guarantees that that program's gonna work, that that program is gonna produce positive effects similar to those effects which were demonstrated in an efficacy and multiple effectiveness trials. That's where we're going and that's what we want. But we do have that continuum. The policy, the Blueprints Policy Group talked about this issue. We've discussed it in a number of different occasions. We developed the continuum that you see on the posters here. It's a little bit hard to read uh, on the slide, but essentially it's a little broader perspective where we look at the term evidence-based on the left-hand side, which gives a check mark and says evidence-based programs are those that have experimental evidence and multiple kinds of experimental evidence. In addition, then, we have opinion-informed and we have research-informed kinds of evidence, which are being used today to justify the claim that a program is an evidence-based program. The clearest example at that opinion level is if you were to talk to Shapiro, who's the producer of the Beyond Scared Straight program, which is on A&E and seems to me to be on every night, <laughs> faced with complaints from the director of the National Institute of Justice, from a number of other people, I wrote a letter complaining about that program and that the evidence for that program suggested it's harmful. <clears throat> His response was, I don't care what you think about that program. I know it works. And I'm going to continue to promote scared straight. That's an opinion. We have somebody that claims that that program works and they know that it works even in the face of contradictory evidence from multiple randomized controlled trials about the effectiveness of that program. So, that's a continuous issue for me, and I run into it when I'm talking to people around the country and promoting blueprints and evidence-based programs, that there are people who say, I know this program works. These are not typically people for whom there's evaluation evidence that shows it doesn't work. But there are people who feel very strongly, and the fact of the matter is these people wouldn't be implementing programs if they didn't believe that that program worked. There's a sense in which that is a kind of evidence which is critical, has to be present 
You don't want to be implementing a program that you don't think is effective. The question is, is that adequate? Is that enough? And what kind of confidence can we place in a program that has that level of evidence? I believe that that level of evidence is a pretty low level of evidence. It is evidence. It's a low level of evidence. The more difficult issue <clears throat> has to do with those programs which we've called here research-based programs, because now we're talking about programs for which we do have research evidence. That evidence <clears throat> can be uh, relatively um, early stages of developing the evidence around a program. <clears throat> the evidence for an effective program starts typically with a process evaluation, an evaluation which demonstrate that the program can get started, can implement the intervention the way it was designed, can recruit the appropriate people into that program, can deliver the program with a level of intensity and quality that's required to produce an outcome, and that they get a, a positive outcome. So, so that's early stages of the, the evidence continuum, and that's important evidence. And then we have studies which have actually done pre-post test assessment. And they know that those kids who came into the program or those families that are participating in the program actually improved over time while they were in the program from the time they started to the point that, that it ended. Critical evidence. And you need to have that kind of evidence because without it, it makes it very difficult to get support for doing a randomized control trial from any foundation or from the federal government and any of the agencies that support that kind of evaluation. So that's very important evidence to have. Every program has to have it at some point. It's a part of the building process towards making the claim that you have an evidence-based program, if we mean by evidence-based, experimentally proven. Then we have correlational studies. And here's where we see the greatest fuzzing of questions about whether a program is evidence-based or not. The IOM most recently reported that there is a significant proportion of evidence reviews that lack scientific rigor and fail to address client, practitioner, and funder needs for current trustworthy information about a program's effectiveness. We have some classic failures. How many of you know about the Rikers social impact bond study? Okay. Here's a case, for example, where this great new funding mechanism. I, I was really excited learning about social impact bonds, where you get investors who are willing to invest in a program and pay for that program with the notion that if the program meets its reduction goals, in this case it was a 10% reduction in recidivism, and that if the program can realize that goal, that they will be reimbursed for all of the costs that they put into that program, and that if it's above a 10% that they share in some of the cost savings to the state so that investors actually could earn money on their investment. What a great idea. What a great idea. So here we have this program. The program was selected. And I just have to say it's a program which would not meet a blueprint standard as being an evidence program, evidence-based program. It was implemented. The results are out. Goldman Sachs is paying for that intervention. They lost the money. They lost the bet, and worse, what is the message that's going to potential investors about this whole strategy? We invested that into a program that didn't have very good evidence for its effectiveness. That's a concern. I worry that we are losing the potential for implementing evidence-based programs because we are investing in programs which are not evidence-based. You know that there's great variation across the registries with respect to what the level of evidence is, but I do have to say at least all of them 
rely upon some experimental level of evidence. At the level of research informed, we don't necessarily. So I'm concerned about the components approach to calling programs evidence-based. My program is evidence-based because I'm using all of the components that MST or FFT or life skills training uses. And I, I, just, I just implement those components in my intervention. And that makes my intervention an evidence-based intervention. Uh, let me say at the outset that the component approach is a valid approach if we take care to address all of the research issues that are around how you identify a component that is causally linked to the outcome, okay? So I'm not opposed to the approach of using components. It's more complicated, however, than just looking at a program and saying, oh, that's the component that they're using. I'm going to put it into my program, and that's going to make my program an evidence-based program. There, there are a number of problems with that. First, very few programs have actually identified what the core components of that program are with any kind of experimental manipulation. Because without experimental manipulation, you cannot argue for a causal connection. That's the first problem. The second problem is that to make a causal claim, you have to have a theoretical explanation for why that component produces that effect on the outcome. So there's a theory that links a component to the outcome. So to make a causal claim, you have to have those two things. You have to have a cause, you have to have a theory which explains what the mechanism is that relinks these two things, and then you have to have evidence that by manipulating that you can demonstrate that there is a causal effect. So that raises a number of questions about how we are using and approaching this whole component approach. The other issue has to do that when you add a component to an existing intervention, the first issue is are you using a consistent program adaptation given the logic models that are involved because that component has a particular logic model. And your existing program has an existing logic model. Those have to be the same or at least consistent with one another before you put them in together. I remember talking to somebody who was making adaptations to life skill training. And so they didn't like the component which had to do with, uh, with dating or you know, having to do with talking about sex. And so they decided to instead implement a scare tactic component into their curriculum. Very different logic model. And the evidence is that that program effects went down as a result of that particular adaptation. So those are the issues that are around this component approach. And, and quite frankly, I think a lot of experts really believe that ultimately that's where we're going to go. We're going to go to components. And people will be able to say, here's a causal connection and implement that program or take this, take this component and that component and make a new program but they will do that aware of what the logic models are and having evidence that those components are, have been demonstrated to be causally linked to the outcome that we're looking at. So one of the programs using this approach, which is being widely implemented today, has to do with the standardized program evaluation protocol, Mark Lipsy's step intervention. And this is a case in which there has been a very sophisticated approach to identifying what those core components are. And that approach essentially was to do a, a multiple regression analysis uh, in his huge meta-analysis to find what components were linked to effect size. The interesting thing about that is that this particular study was very clear in stating we don't have any theoretical model involved. This is an a-theoretical study. It was an exploratory study. 
What that means is there was no theory that said these are the components which are linked to the outcome. So there was no theory involved. The particular component that's most problematic has to do with what's called therapeutic type. I, I don't think there's much question about the fact that research has shown that you get greater effect sizes when you deal with higher risk uh, clients in your program, that dose and quality of implementation, fidelity, are critical. You know. But therapeutic type, therapeutic type included all kinds of programs with very different logic models. And the internal variation in that type was greater than the variation between that type and discipline and supervisory kinds of programs which Lipsy argues are ineffective. Okay, so that's the issue. The program is one in which juvenile justice agencies are told that if you can match these components in your intervention, you now have an evidence-based intervention. Easy in many ways to, to talk justice departments into implementing this. It doesn't require much in the change of philosophy. It doesn't require a great deal. And so it's working, it's being adopted widely by juvenile justice systems across this country, particularly in Pennsylvania. And there are some other states where it's happening. That's a problem for me because there are some serious limitations with this use of a component approach to evidence-based claims. First of all, it's a theoretical, an ad hoc construction of the components into this group called therapeutic type, where the effect variances were in that type were greater than between types. There's no experimental evidence that links those components to the outcome. There is no manipulation of those components in an experimental study. There's been no evaluation of SPEP as an intervention. It's being implemented, and it has never been evaluated. Not only don't we have experimental evidence, we have no replication. So it's not a surprise to me that none of the registries acknowledge SPEP as an evidence-based program. But that program calls itself, or it is being called, as an evidence-based intervention. That's confusing people. One of the biggest obstacles we have in the translation of research findings into policy and into practice is that the prevention research community cannot deliver consensus around the, any recommendation. We carry, we, the, the prevention science community, bear the responsibility for not being able to give a clear message to policymakers. We can't agree upon what evidence means. We can't agree upon what the standards should be. And, and that's a huge problem for us. So here's some recommendations that I'm making about how we can address that. I, I, I think. First of all, we need to stop implementing programs that are known to be ineffective. The scared straight example is critical, but we have others. The 21st century learning centers in this country, the evaluation showed harmful effects. So we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year in implementing 21st century learning centers in this country. Secondly, we should always select what I'm calling an experimentally proven program, an EPP, to avoid the ambiguity around the term evidence. So we should always select an experimentally proven program when one is available and when it fits your need. And that second part is critical because I'm going to be the first to admit that we don't have experimentally proven programs that are needed in many communities for particular issues and populations. I mean, some of our evidence-based programs have very limited population applicability. So we need more programs. 
So you select one if it's available and it fits. What I'm t suggesting is we go down this evidence hierarchy. We take the best evidence program if it will meet our needs. And then if not, we go to the next level. When there is no experimentally proven program that fits, then we use the best evidence available. And that's a policy. That's a policy which led initially to the whole idea of a continuum. And I buy into that. I say we should use the very best evidence available. And if we do use something other than an experimentally proven program, then we have to commit to do an evaluation of that program. So here are some other things to consider when no, there's no evidence-based or experimentally proven program. First, consider the adaptation of an existing effective program. Check the program with respect to the risk and protective factors that it has demonstrated effectiveness on. If you look at the blueprints list of the targeted risk and protective factors, you'll note that we have started putting an asterisk by that risk or that protective factor when the evaluations demonstrated that they actually changed that risk factor or that protective factor. That's, that's very important because it provides evidence that if you have an outcome for which that's a risk condition, even though you don't have an evidence-based program that has looked at that outcome, you have evidence that that risk condition which you are targeting for change was changed by that program. So that's the kind of using evidence that can lead to the adaptation of existing programs in, a, in, in I think, an appropriate way. Note again that any adaptation has to be consistent with the logic model and that we work, we ask that you work with the developer on any specific modifications that are going to be made and you must commit to doing an evaluation of that intervention. Second strategy, if that doesn't work, we go clear down to the point that you have no certified programs to draw from. You can still choose then from those lower levels of evidence on that continuum to choose the best evidence available. My suggestion is you can look at best practices, uh, proven stra change strategies, um, and again, you have to evaluate that program. So I'm with everybody who says we implement on a policy which says best evidence. But let's be clear where the line is between what we call an evidence-based policy and what we call an informed evidence policy or research policy or an opinion-based policy. Okay, so here are the options I think we face today. We have to either achieve better agreement on what the label evidence space means. I have to have convinced you here that when we talk about evidence space, we're talking about experimental evidence. Or we need to drop that term and talk about experimentally proven programs or some other label that denotes a standard with respect to the type and level or quality of evidence that must be present, present excuse me, before we think about scale up. You'll note on the Blueprints website that we, we have promising programs model and model plus programs, but you'll also note that we recommend promising programs do not have the level of evidence necessary to take that program to scale. We don't have enough evidence. The scientific criteria for evidence suggests that you have to have at least some preliminary evidence. There must be a replication, at least one or two, that's you know, critical. And we believe you have to have evidence of sustainability, that that effect will endure after the program ends for some period of time. And I acknowledge one year is arbitrary, but at least it allows us to say that those people who have been in a program and have completed that program a year later are still showing the positive benefit of being in that program. There are a lot of programs, particularly behavior modification programs in residential settings, where we can change the behavior 
of a child or an adolescent in that program within a relatively short period of time because we're controlling all of the positive rewards and all of the punishments and negative reinforcements. What we know is that if they leave that setting and go back home to the same family situation, to the same peer group, and to the same circumstances at school, that those effects are lost in a very short time. We want programs that, while in that setting, taught those kids how to make better adaptations to those environments, provided resources that allow them to react differently and to make better adaptations when they leave. So we want programs that have evidence of sustained effects. All right. So those are the issues, it seems to me. And the question is, have I convinced you? In which case, I will leave here optimistic that we can still talk about evidence-based programs. Or I will leave here hereafter talking about experimentally proved programs and no longer talk about evidence-based programs. What I'd like to do at this point is turn in a more positive light and talk about the future of blueprints coming into 2016 and 2017. Um, we were really reacting to the Bridgespan report on what's, the, what's called the What Place uh, or the What Works Marketplace study. I don't know if you know that study, but it was a study and it was referred to uh, yesterday morning. Uh, both of our speakers were really talking about um, findings from that study. I was shocked to learn that most decision makers don't even look at registries. Not, not just they don't look at blueprints. They don't look at crime solutions. They don't look at the model program guide. They don't look at child trends. They don't look at CDC. They don't look at registries. They make decisions on other grounds. That, that was shocking to me. So w we talked about the recommendations coming out of that program and blueprints would like to try to address those issues so that the Blueprints Registry becomes meaningful, becomes useful to decision makers, and that we have the kinds of information there and the guides to help them make good, informed decisions. One of the findings from that was that decision makers simply didn't understand the distinction between promising model and model plus, or between promising and effective. And that their view was if a program appeared on any of the registries, that meant it was evidence-based. So I've, I've talked to people who told me that, oh, we're an evidence-based program. We're listed on NREP. And I said, well, you know, what were your scores? You have two scores. What were they? Oh, I don't know. I think they were 1.5 1 1 or 2, which tells us that the research that was done wasn't very good research. But I'm on the registry. So, you know, that, that's a problem. So what we have done is developed an expanded set of strategies for the Blueprints uh, website and for our initiative, and, and I wanted to share those with you. We are still being funded by NEE Casey. We're very grateful for, for seven years of funding from the Casey Foundation, which has enabled us I think to make major improvements on our website and expand. So we, we went through an expansion like this uh, when we initially uh, became funded uh, from the NE Casey Foundation. And we're now in that, a position in which with that funding uh, uh, running down that we now have uh, secured funding from a new partner from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. And we're grateful for funding from them, which is specifically designed to fund these new expansions. First of all, we will now be rating practices and policies as well as programs. Uh, if, if you've been looking at our website, you will notice all of what we have there are programs. We haven't looked at any practices. The only registry right now that includes practices uh, is the OJP registry. Uh, crime Solutions, and uh, the Model Program Guide, which is essentially the same website just for juvenile uh, programs and practices. So Blueprints will join uh, those registries in, 
in, in rating practices and programs. Uh, we will now be looking at adult outcomes in the uh, crime, uh, criminal justice areas. Uh, this is something specific to the needs of the Arnold Foundation, and we're, we're happy to make that expansion. So you will now see adult programs in that particular outcome area uh, on the Blueprint website. All programs and practices that we have in our database, which is some 1,500 programs, we will now provide a rating for. So you can get on, it's going to take a while, but say by this time next year, um, you should probably be able to get on the website and look up any of those programs and see how we rate their evidence base. The great majority of them, we will say there have been no evaluations, no evaluations of, of any quality done for that program. Or we can say there have been evaluations done on that, uh, but there is no predominant effect. We're getting mixed effects. We're getting some cases we're getting positive effects. Some cases we're getting no effect. So that would be another kind of rating classification. Or it could be that we've looked at the program and the evidence indicates that there are harmful effects for that program. Or we can say it's a promising program. So every program in the database will receive a rating. That was one of the things that the decision makers that were interviewed in that study said that they, that they wanted. They wanted to be able to see how a specific program looked with respect to the quality of evidence that was available for that program. So we hope to be able to provide that kind of evidence. And then finally, we want to expand the information that's available on each of our uh, promising model, model plus programs to facilitate better decision making. We would like to provide evidence as, that would provide a, a program which would well, walk potential decision makers through a decision process, uh, helping them, guiding them with respect to how to make an informed decision about what program to select, which deals with the issue of fit as well as with the issue of quality of the evidence. So that's our plan. It's an ambitious undertaking at this point. We're taking to our, our advisory board some recommendations about what the standard should be for rating practices. It, it's very hard to do randomized control trials with practices. So maybe the standard for evaluating and recommending practices will be lower than it is for programs. So the board will be looking at that and making some decisions about that. We will be taking to the board a recommendation about that rating system and what that ought to look like. So we plan to have a fast start, um, and we already have some adult programs on the, the agenda for the board to review in May. We meet next month. Um, so hopefully you will see some brand new kinds of expansion of evidence uh, and information available on our website. So that's what's in store. We're excited about the ability to make these expansions um, and hope that, uh, that you find them helpful. And we welcome your comments and suggestions as these things develop and you see them coming up on our website. So that's it. You've heard my complaint. You've heard my uh, excitement, I hope, about the future of Blueprints and where we're going. So I, I want to thank each one of you for coming. Uh, don't go home yet. We've got some great discussion groups coming uh, and opportunities to, persist, to participate in, in that kind of an interactive uh, setting. Um, and then I wish you Godspeed going home. Thank you. Just a few real quick announcements, final announcements. Remember to turn in your evaluation forms at the registration desk. It would be a terrible tragedy for us to neglect doing an evaluation. <laughs> so we rely upon your goodwill to give us that information and it helps with respect to the programming and planning uh, for our next conference. Then I would like to acknowledge I, th I think this has been a terrific uh, conference. I, I think it's, you know, it, it's been 
uh, very well, uh, logistically, it's been very well run. Uh, I, I'm really pleased with how it works, and I want to recognize, first of all, Trio Solutions. But where's Jennifer? <clears throat> there she is, down at the end. For a, a fantastic job again, we are so grateful for the, the fantastic job you do for us. Then I'd like to ask all of you who are here who are members of the planning committee, would you stand? This is the group that plans these, uh, these conferences. This, this group puts in a lot of time working through all of the decisions about that have to be made to put on a, a conference like this. And I, I personally want to thank each of you for uh, the time and, and investment and great expertise you brought uh, to that task. And then finally, I, I have to acknowledge that our whole Blueprints initiative hangs critically on one person, and that's Sharon Mihalik. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day, and we hope to see you all back in two years. No questions? Oh, no questions. Oh, yeah. Do we, do we have, have time? Can we, do you all mind if we do a few questions? We love do questions. Time? I don't have the time. <laughs> see, I overwhelmed you okay. all. No we questions. We don't have time. I'm sorry. No time. <laughs> okay. We'll see you next Next conference.